I was discussing the war film The Cockle Shell Heroes recently with some blokes after one of my live talks. The conversation turned to whether it was based upon real events, and if so, how close was the film to the truth? So, I decided to do a little bit of research, and here's what I've found. Released in 1955, The Cockle Shell Heroes starred Trevor Howard, Christopher Lee, David Lodge and Anthony Newley, and tells the story of a daring raid by British commandos in kayaks who plant mines on some German ships. It was actually based upon a real historic event during World War II, Operation Frankton, when British commandos conducted a daring sabotage attack on German ships in the French port of Bordeaux. The main role in the Cockle Shell Heroes was taken by José Ferrer, who also directed the film. <laughs> Incidentally, he's the uncle to actor George Clooney. Ferrer, who had starred in the Kane Mutiny the previous year, played the commander of the raid, Major Stringer. Although, that's not the name of the commander in the actual raid. In fact, the names of all the characters in the film were changed from the real events. And whilst it's a great action film with some great characters, the real events and the real Cockleshell heroes are even more inspiring than the film. This is the real story of the Cockleshell heroes in World War II. All right, let me be honest, it might not be my absolute favourite World War II film. After all, there are so many other contenders. For instance, The Longest Day, The Battle of Britain, Bridge Too Far. But The Cockleshell Heroes is definitely up there. But I'm interested in what your favourite Second World War film is. Drop me a line in the comments below. And you never know, I might even make a video about the most popular one or ones. Anyway, back to the real event depicted in the film, Operation Frankton. Five Cockle Mark II kayaks, each crewed by two commandos, were launched from a British submarine in the dead of night in December 1942. And over the next four days, they paddled nearly 80 miles up the tidal Gironde River to Bordeaux. Only two crews reached the destination, where they planted limpet mines on five German freight vessels and a German naval patrol boat. Following the attack, they attempted to reach neutral Spain and from there the British colony of Gibraltar. Only one crew made it. Of the rest, two died from hypothermia when their kayak capsized and six were executed by the Germans following an order from Hitler. The real commander was Maverick Royal Marine Officer Captain Herbert Blondie Hasler. 28-year-old Hasler was four years younger than Ferrer when he played the lead role in the film. He was born in Dublin in 1914 whilst his father, a British Army officer, was stationed there. His father was to die during the First World War when his troop ship was torpedoed. Herbert George Hasler was a born adventurer with a love for boats. While still at school, he had built his first canoe following instructions in the boy's own paper. This paper come magazine, which contained stories of adventure and sport along with survival skills and competitions, was published for nearly 100 years until 1967. Now, I can't let this opportunity pass. Did you read Boy's Own? Or if not, what comic or magazine did you read when you were growing up? Nicknamed Blondie, Hasler was commissioned in the Royal Marines in 1932. In the early days of the Second World War, he participated in the Norwegian campaign in 1940, where he served alongside a detachment from the French Foreign Legion. For his actions in Norway, he was awarded the OBE, as well as the French Croix de Guerre. On his return to Britain, he lobbied the Admiralty with his idea of using canoes to attack enemy ships in harbours, <laughs> but his ideas were dismissed as a bit too boy's own for their liking. However, Britain's enemies were to come to his, or rather his plans, rescue. In the spring of 1941, the Italians had used explosive motorboats to attack British ships lying at anchor off the Greek island of Crete. The attack sunk a Norwegian tanker and severely damaged a Royal Navy heavy cruiser, HMS York. In December 1941, they struck again. This time, manning tiny craft nicknamed Human Torpedoes, they damaged HMS Queen Elizabeth and HMS Valiant at Alexandria in Egypt. Admiral Lord Louis Mountbatten, Chief of Combined Operations, came under pressure from British Prime Minister Winston Churchill to strike back in a similar fashion. And suddenly, Hasler's madcap scheme was not so bonkers after all. He was posted to the Combined Operations Development Centre on the Solent, where he was placed in command of several captured Italian motorboats. 
In an effort to deceive the enemy, it was announced that these were boom patrol boats, whose purpose was to protect Portsmouth Harbour. And thus, the Royal Marine Boom Patrol Detachment was born. It would be the nucleus for the special boat service after the war. Despite the Royal Navy's best efforts to blockade the German-held ports on the western coastline of Europe, some German blockade busters had managed to get through. One of the centres of this blockade busting was the French port at Bordeaux. Over 70 miles up the Gironde River, it was too well protected and inland for a standard Royal Navy attack. Not a textbook Navy attack? That was just what Maverick Hasler was after. He did, however, face a problem. The Italian boats, while smaller than a Royal Navy destroyer or even a frigate, would be easily spotted travelling the 70 plus miles up the Gironde and would be destroyed long before they reached Bordeaux. It needed something altogether more subtle and dangerous. Hasler's idea of attacking German shipping using canoes was dusted off and Operation Frankton was on. He planned to carry out the attack using collapsible kayaks based upon the type used by the Inuits of northern Canada. Capable of carrying two men, these canvas-sided kayaks were called cockles, or officially, cockle Mark IIs, and hence, the cockle shell heroes. The cockle Mark IIs were manufactured at the Saunders and Row, or Saro works at Cowes on the Isle of Wight. Apart from the two-man crew, these shallow draft cockles were designed to carry about 150 pounds of equipment, including food and clothing for the journey up the Gironde to Bordeaux, a silent Sten gun, two grenades, two Colt 45 pistols, and eight limpet mines. The last of those items would be placed on the sides of the German vessels at anchor in the seeming safety of Bordeaux. In October 1942, Hasler's plan was approved by Mountbatten, but the Chief of Combined Operations insisted that six, and not Hasler's intended four, cockle kayaks took part in the raid. Following intense practice on the Swale, which is a tidal channel in the Thames estuary that separates the Isle of Sheppey from mainland Kent, the carefully selected team from the Royal Marine Boom Patrol Detachment were ready for one of the most daring British commando raids of the Second World War. On the 30th of November 1942, the six two-man cockle crews, plus a reserve member, set sail on a British submarine, HMS Tuna, from Holy Lock in Scotland. Tuna had been launched in May 1940 and was captained by Lieutenant Commander Dick Rakes. In the film The Cockleshell Heroes, Rakes is renamed Lieutenant Commander Greaves and is played by Christopher Lee. Probably best known for playing Dracula in the Hammer horror films, Lee, who also played Bond villain at Scaramanga in The Man with the Golden Gun, had a fascinating war record in his own right. And maybe I'll tell you his story sometime. As an aside, but thinking of James Bond, the producer of the Cockleshell Heroes was Cubby Broccoli, who produced all of the 007 films from 1962, Dr. No, right through to the end of the 1980s. The submarine captain had intended to arrive at the mouth of the Gironde on the 6th of December, but adverse weather and then a minefield delayed his arrival by 24 hours. Finally, on the early evening of the 7th of December, HMS Tuna surfaced about 10 miles from the mouth of the French River. Hasler had decided to break his attack into two divisions, three kayaks, all named after sea creatures, in each division. In his own A division, Hasler and Marine Sparks were in the Catfish. Along with them would be Corporal Laver and Marine Mills in the Crayfish, and Corporal Sherd and Marine Muffet in the Conga. Their objective would be to attack enemy ships in the West Dock at Bordeaux. Attacking the East Dock would be B Division, led by Lieutenant McKinnon and Marine Conway in the Cuttlefish along with Sergeant Wallace and Marine Ewart in the Coolfish, and finally Marines Ellery and Fisher in the Cachalot. Even before the Cockleshell heroes had started out on their mission, disaster struck. As the Cachalot was being manhandled onto the deck of the submarine, its canvas sides were damaged, making it useless. Marines Ellery and Fisher were forced to look on as the rest of their commando mates gently paddled away from HMS Tuna. Slowly they disappeared into the dark of the winter night. Rakes noted in the ship's log at 8.22pm, quote, Waved au revoir to a magnificent bunch of black-faced villains with whom it's been a real pleasure to work with, end quote. HMS Tuna would go on to destroy three German U-boats during the war, and Lieutenant Commander Dick Rakes 
would participate in Operation Deadlight at the end of the war. Here he captained several U-boats as they were towed out to sea to be scuttled. In total over 100 captured German submarines were sent to the bottom during this post-war operation. Despite their training on the tidal swale in Kent, the tides at the mouth of the Gironde were a new experience. The strong tidal race combined with crosswinds to make the going incredibly hard. Facing those hazards of nature, coalfish disappeared from sight. And then even worse, the conga capsized. Its occupants, Corporal Sheard and Marine Moffat, had to hold on to the tail of Hasler's cockle, the catfish, in the freezing water. Blondie Hasler now decided to paddle towards the shoreline, before telling the two marines that he was dragging behind him to swim for it and rely on their training and resources and luck to strike out for the Spanish border well over 100 miles to the south. So let's recap. On that opening night and only just entering the mouth of the river, still 70 miles from their target, Hasler's force had already been halved. Paddling as quietly as they could, the plan was to travel only at night to avoid detection. Whilst decreasing their chances of being spotted, it also meant that their travel time was limited. Moreover, the Gironde was a tidal river. If they paddled with the flood tide, they could cover a fair distance. But if they were battling against the ebb tide, then it would almost feel like they were paddling through treacle. Resting up in the scrub on the riverbank during the day, it would take an estimated four nights to reach Bordeaux. On that opening night of Operation Frankton, they came across four German patrol boats anchored ahead of them. The cockleshell heroes were forced to silently paddle past them whilst lying on their backs. Catfish and crayfish managed the manoeuvre, but they lost contact with Lieutenant McKinnon and Marine Conway in the cuttlefish. At 6.30am, the two remaining cockle Mark II kayaks pulled onto the riverbank to rest. Carefully using the reeds to camouflage their boats, the four men Hasler, Corporal Laver, and Marines Sparks and Mills took cover in the nearby scrub for a well-earned rest. But their rest was suddenly interrupted when some local fishermen and their wives stumbled across them. Hasler was, to use the old British nautical phrase, between the devil and the deep blue sea. He could either get back on the water in broad daylight and hope they weren't spotted, or he could hope that the French wouldn't inform the local gendarmerie. Pleading with them not to say a word, the four British commandos watched the French disappear into the distance. The minutes ticked by. The hours ticked by. Finally, darkness descended on them. The French civilians had kept their promise not to talk. Hurriedly, Hassler and his remaining men pushed their kayaks back out onto the silent Gironde and climbed aboard. That second night was so cold that ice formed on the cockpit covers. The following night, they had to paddle against a six-hour ebb tide. In other words, for six out of the nine hours they worked that night, they were going against the tide. In the end, the men and the two cockles were so exhausted that Hassler decided to pull up on an island to rest for the rest of the night and through the next day. They were now running behind schedule, but at least they hadn't been spotted by the Germans. Or had they? I'll tell you in a moment. On the fourth night, which should have been the night of their attack, the men slowly paddled to a secluded spot close to Bordeaux. There, as the daylight broke, and keeping as still and silent as possible, they prepared their limpet mines. The fuses were set for 9pm that night. With his attack force down from six to two boats, Hasler decided that he and Marine Bill Sparks in the Catfish would head to the West Dock, whilst Corporal Laver and Marine Mills would head to the East Dock in the Crayfish. Finally, as dark fell on the night of the 11th of December 1942, they quietly approached the docks. They had less than four hours to get in and get out. Hasler and Sparks gently paddled into the western dock and placed eight mines on four vessels, including a Kriegsmarine patrol boat. Suddenly above them, on the patrol boat, a torch pierced through the darkness towards them. A sentry had chosen the very minute that the catfish was by the anchor chain to check on the surrounding water. The light flashed this way and then that. Surely it was all over. And then as suddenly as the light had appeared, it was switched off. The sentry had done his job. 70 miles from any Royal Navy ships, his patrol boat was safe here in Bordeaux. Meanwhile, over in the East Dock, Laver and Mills in Crayfish made for a cargo ship, the Tannenfeld. The Tannenfeld was a celebrated blockade runner, launched in 1938. In 1941, 
she had found herself on the east coast of Africa in the Italian colony of Somalia, or Somaliland as it was called at the time, when the British invaded. In an effort to escape capture, she had set out on an epic escape journey, travelling all the way down the east coast of Africa to the Cape of Good Hope, and then steaming up the entire Atlantic, evading Royal Navy patrols to arrive here in Bordeaux. Now the commandos placed five limpet mines on the hull of the blockade runner, and they used their remaining three mines on a small liner moored nearby. Now both crews swiftly made their way out of the docks and back down the Gironde, meeting up on a nearby island. In the distance, they could hear muffled explosions. Operation Frankton had been a success. Exactly how successful they didn't know. They had bigger things to worry about, like getting back to Britain. The plan had always been to make their way overland to the Pyrenees and cross into neutral Spain before making for the safety of British Gibraltar. Sometime after 6am the morning after the attack, the two crews scuttled their Cockle Mark II kayaks about 100 yards or metres from each other on the south bank of the Gironde, and then separately struck out for Spain. Only Hassler and Sparks were to make it. Back in Britain, combined ops and the remaining men of the Royal Marine Boom Patrol Detachment waited for news. The very first news that Mountbatten received was actually via an intercepted German military communique on the 10th of December, over 24 hours before the attack in the docks. The Germans reported that they had captured a British sabotage squad near the mouth of the Gironde. Not that Mountbatten knew that, but it was Sergeant Wallace and Marine Ewart who had disappeared on the opening night in the Coalfish. After four days on the run, Lieutenant McKinnon and Marine Conway had also been captured. And the final haul for the Germans were Corporal Laver and Marine Mills, who had scuttled the crayfish on the morning following the attack and were now making their way towards the mountainous border with Spain. Earlier that year, following a British commando raid on the Channel Island of Sark, some Germans, having surrendered, were shot whilst tied up. Now, whether it was by accident or design is hotly debated. Hitler chose to believe it was by design and therefore issued in retaliation, issued an order that any British commandos captured in the future, whether in uniform or not, were to be executed. And thus it was that Cockleshell heroes Lieutenant McKinnon, Sergeant Wallace, Corporal Laver and Marines Mills, Conway and Ewart were executed. You might be doing your sums and have noticed that if six men were executed and two men escaped, that leaves two men outstanding. And you're right. Corporal Sheard and Marine Moffat, whose kayak, Conga, had capsized on the first night. They swam to the shore, but died of hypothermia. In late February 1943, Combined Operations Headquarters finally received a message from the French Resistance, informing them that after three months on the run, Hasler and Sparks were safe and well. The message came from Mary Lindell, a British World War I nurse who had married a Frenchman, and now with the code name Murray Claire, she ran an underground network that helped over 100 Allied airmen escape to safety. Afterwards, Bill Sparks, a tough Londoner from Clerkenwell, recalled with amusement Captain Hasler being ordered around by this small, feisty lady. She might have been half the size of Hasler, but as Sparks recalled, there was no doubt that she was the governor. Both men were spirited across the border and eventually arrived back in Britain. Hazler was awarded the Distinguished Service Order, the DSO, and Sparks the Distinguished Service Medal. Laver and Mills were posthumously mentioned in dispatches. Operation Frankton, the attack on the docks at Bordeaux by the Cockleshell heroes, resulted in at least three German ships being put out of action. Included in these casualties was the blockade breaker, Tannenfels, which was so badly damaged that the Germans decided that her best future lay as a block ship, and so scuttled her in the Gironde in 1944. Operation Frankton could have been more damaging if there had been more joined up thinking in the British military. In 2011, former MP and Special Boat Service Officer Paddy Ashdown shed light on this flaw. According to Ashdown in a Time Watch documentary, unbeknownst to combined operations, the Special Operations Executive, SOE, were also planning an attack on the docks. Their plan was to infiltrate from the land and place explosives on the ships. The SOE sabotage attack was being coordinated by a Mauritian, Claude de Bessac. Now, here's a little piece of information from World War II which you might like. Mauritius was a French colony in the Indian Ocean, 
captured by the British during the Napoleonic Wars. So for 130 years, the inhabitants were British subjects, but like de Bessac, spoke French, and were thus ideal candidates to work as agents in German-occupied France. Over a dozen Mauritians served as SOE operatives in France during World War II, which is not a bad contribution from a tiny island with a population of less than 500,000 at the time. It's intriguing to wonder what might have happened if the Mauritian and Hasla had coordinated their efforts. But it was not to be. Although, as a result of this missed opportunity, the two organisations did share plans for the rest of the war. Herbert Blondie Hasler rose to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. After the war, he continued his passion for small marine craft and became an accomplished single-handed or solo yachtsman. In 1960, he participated in the Plymouth to New York solo Atlantic race, finishing runner-up to Sir Francis Chichester. He died in Glasgow in 1987, aged 83. The other survivor from the actual attack, Marine Bill Sparks, became a bus driver and then a conductor in Essex. He also served in the police during the Malaya emergency. He eventually retired to East Sussex, where he died in 2002. Back in the 1950s, Sparks had also served as an advisor on the film, The Cockleshell Heroes. Which neatly brings me back to the film that started my quest, and this story. No, it's not like the real events of Operation Frankton. <laughs> For a start, all the names are changed. There is some love interest in the film as well. But what it does do is pay homage to these brave men, and it keeps their memory and their brave mission alive when so many others have faded from memory. After all, it was because I was talking to those men after that split talk about uh, the film itself that I've ended up making this video about the real events. In 2015, a memorial to the Cockleshell Heroes was unveiled at the National Arboretum in Staffordshire. The Cachalot, the cockle Mark II that was damaged beyond repair on board HMS Tuna on that opening night of the operation, was returned to Britain and somehow ended up in the warehouse at Surrow where she'd been built. And years later, she was discovered and repaired, and now you can see the only surviving cockleshell hero boat at the Combined Military Services Museum at Malden in Essex. Operation Frankton was a costly raid. Eight of the ten men who left HMS Tuna were lost. Militarily and strategically, its results are questionable. But what is undisputed is the bravery of the men involved. As Admiral Lord Louis Mountbatten said, of the brave and dashing raids carried out by the men of the Combined Operations Command, none was more courageous or imaginative than Operation Frankton. So next time you watch the film, remember those real, brave, cockleshell heroes. Well, thanks for watching and I hope you enjoyed it. Whilst I try to get my stories historically accurate, I also try to bring history to life. So, what stories from either British or British military history would you like to hear about in the future? Drop me a line in the comments below. And if you haven't already, please do subscribe to my channel so you don't miss future videos, maybe even become a member. Click on the buttons below. Thanks for joining me today. Keep well, and I'll see you again very soon.